Good. So the second speaker of the session, which is a pleasure to have, is uh, Axel Cortez Cubero, and he will talk about GHD as first order in the thermodynamic form factor expansion. In a thermodynamic form factor expansion, please. <clears throat> Yeah, so first, uh, sorry, there's like a construction next, do next door. I'm in my house, so there might be noise. Uh, and uh, yeah, so thanks for the invitation for uh, the organizers. Uh, all right, so let's just go. So I will uh, focus uh, in particular, I can't keep paying this now. Uh, on uh, one plus one, the integrable quantum field theories because they are particularly simple kind of integrable models. And this is my one slide uh, summary of quantum field theory. So what we have is a, a space-time continuum, it's in a, a continuum theory. And the things we want to observe are uh, uh, correlation functions. So here is a two-point uh, function where we have one co operator inserted one point and one another point. And then you look at things like correlation functions, which are uh, a function of these two operators issues and the separations between the two operators. And this is the picture in a boring old uh, vacuum. And uh, this uh, would be uh, very cool to do in the 80s. Anyway, so there's a general strategy to compute this kind of uh, correlators in uh, integrable field theory, which is a uh, uh, a form factor expansion. So what you do is uh, you insert between the two operators a complete set of eigenstates of your theory. And there's a few nice things afforded to you by your relativistic uh, invariance, like you can parameterize the X and T dependence in this nice uh, relativistic way, depending on the momentum and energy of these eigenstates. And uh, that's the so in a relativistic uh, integrable field theory, you know what these uh, eigenstates look like because what you have is a, a number of uh, particle states uh, on top of the vacuum. So you can have any number n of particles and you parameterize each particle by their rapidity, which is a way to parameterize their energy and momentum in a relativistic way. Here I'm focusing on a simple, uh, particularly simple example where you just have one kind of particle with one man mass n. Uh, anyway, so you defined uh, this, uh, this is what is defined as a form factor, which is the matrix element of your field with a given particle states and the vacuum. And the point is uh, if you know a handful of these uh, form factors, you can approximate a correlation function quite simply. So, uh, yeah, so the first few excitations on top of the vacuum are enough for if you're interested in the long distance properties of the correlator. Uh, so for instance, here for the two point function, the one particle form factor already tells you a lot. So here you put only the one particle state on top of the vacuum. And from this, you can compute long distance approximation that uh, you can do a stationary phase approximation on this uh, integral over the rapidity of that one particle. And that tells you that generically a massive integrable field theory has uh, some uh, exponential behavior in our two-part function, where this uh, either decay or oscillatory depends on whether the separation is uh, time-like or uh, space-like. So here are a few nice properties of form factors that in particular that we will need in this uh, talk. So this is, uh, uh, sorry for my uh, rustic uh, pictures, but uh, there is a worldwide pandemic. So this is what, this is what we deserve now. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so this is a nice uh, way of uh, drawing a form factor where you say this is the operator and I have my incoming state with n particles coming in. And here's my outgoing state where I have the vacuum. A uh, nice property in relativistic theory is that I can, from this one, obtain a form factor with one outgoing particle. By using crossing symmetry, you turn one incoming into a one outgoing particle, and that amounts to shifting the rapidity. Of the yeah. uh, another important point is that uh, you have uh, annihilation poles, which basically means that 
an outgoing particle can annihilate with one of the incoming particles. And this is reflected in the fact that there is a simple pole in the form factor when this rapidity coincides with one of these rapidities. And the residue of the form factor at that location is proportional to the form factor without those two particles. So with those particles having an idea. Okay. And that gives you a sort of a recurrence relation that uh, if you go to that particular point, uh, you can relate the form factor with the one with two fewer particles. And you could do the same with uh, this one also have, has poles at particular values of the repeat. Uh, okay. So now let's talk about uh, GHD while we're here. So this is my uh, interpretation of uh, GHD, what it's good for. is uh, So you have some effective theory that allows you to compute uh, correlation functions. Uh, when you have, so you want to compute a correlation function now on some fancy excited state. So here I call it rho, where it's uh, some uh, thermodynamic state which has a finite energy density. And the uh, nice point is that uh, this uh, state can also break translation invariance, and that's when GHD is particularly useful. For instance, so this is a kind of state we will examine later on, which you can look at an excited state which looks like a generalized Gibbs ensemble, but uh, with a kind of uh, position dependent uh, chemical potentials that makes it a. Uh, uh, in homogeneous uh, state and uh, yeah. So GHD allows you to compute uh, nice things and weird excited states like this, instead of the vacuum, which is what you could talk about. Uh, so uh, how GHD works with another rustic picture is uh, the approach is basically you take your space time and you cut it off into uh, little cells, which are uh, large in a sense that you can do a uh, average of the fields within uh, one cell here and uh, the the main assumption in the uh, GHD is that you say okay so if I look at an operator within one cell the expectation value here in this cell looks sort of like a normal GGE expectation value, but with a chemical set of chemical. But with a exposition dependent. Uh, no. So uh, GHD is basically uh, gives you a way to find an evolution equation for uh, these uh, chemical potentials. And once you have that, you can get your, your local expectation values. Yeah. But this is uh, an assumption in uh, GHD, which is uh, one of the things we want to do here is uh, find this from a very brute, very uh, stupid uh, form factors and arrive at this thing instead, instead of making this a uh, nice educated assumption. Right. So here are uh, the two goals of what we want to do here. Uh, as a GHD especially shines when you have inhomogeneous excited states, but it also has some uh, nice uh, insights for homogeneous states. So there's a particularly nice uh, uh, prediction from uh, this paper for a two point function in a homogeneous uh, but a uh, highly excited state. And uh, I'll show you what this prediction is later, but we want we will match the prediction from a GHD with just doing uh, form factors. Uh, here there's a, a spoiler that you see that uh, I have scaled this two point function with the, linearly with the separation in time between the two operators because uh, the prediction from a GHD gives you a correlator that decays as one over T. And you see this is different from the ground state correlators that I showed you before that decay exponentially. So something must happen differently between 
our ground state intuition that you get exponential decay and uh, this uh, GHD prediction. And then the other thing we want to get to is uh, uh, so we want to compute using form factors one point function in an inhomogeneous state. And so two point functions in homogeneous, one point in homogeneous. So let's start. Uh, so this is a brief uh, review of thermodynamics, what these uh, excited states look like, the homogeneous ones. Uh, basically, uh, what this says, you have a thermodynamic uh, larger number of particles, so you have n particles in your uh, in your state, such that that number grows with the system size, and you keep it, uh, you keep the density fixed. So there's a thermodynamic background. And you can further characterize the, this background by saying the probability that you will find that background a certain rapidity of particles. So you can specify the distribution of these rapidities. And uh, for instance, you can calculate the, the energy of this uh, thermodynamic ground state by basically adding over the energy of each particle in this background governed by this uh, distribution. Uh, here I use the term ground state loosely because as we'll see, uh, it's not a ground state because you can go to energy lower than that energy as well as higher, but uh, let's call it a ground state. Uh, so now what we want to do is uh, uh, look at form factors which uh, uh, based on the particle excitations which leave above this uh, thermodynamic background instead of above of the vacuum. Right? Uh, um, so we want to look at, so we want to study the excitations on top of this thermodynamic state, which looks something like this. So uh, you choose a particular uh, state that realizes this distribution. And then if you want, you can add a couple more particles on top of that state. Uh, now, an important thing is that when you add, and a, a certain number of particles on top of that state that brings some modification to the background particles. So here I denoted with a prime that is not exactly the same background state, but you shifted it by adding more particles. And then the point is uh, you can also now remove particles from the from the background, uh, which in this relativistic case is equivalent to adding a particle with a shifted rapidity like this. Uh, so this is uh, uh, different now from the ground state. So you didn't have this, you weren't allowed to do that in the ground state because you can't remove particles from the ground state. Uh, so now we want to look at the, what we did for the ground state to look at the first uh, form factors that contribute to a two point function. So here is a quick study of what are the low lying excitations on top of this thermodynamic uh, background. Uh, so we can look at something uh, similar to the ground state. So I, I say, so this is my form factor defined on this thermodynamic uh, state uh, row, where I say I have the thermodynamic state, my operator, and the thermodynamic state with one particle on top. Uh, on top. So this is analogous to the, you know. So the point is this, because it's very similar to the one particle uh, form factor from before, it, it actually leads to very, uh, qualitatively similar exponential decay behavior. So this is not what we want to reach uh, GHT. Similarly, you could uh, take a one whole form factor where you just remove one particle from the form factor, but that will also lead to an exponential uh, behavior. So this, uh, these two contributions actually are subleading. Uh, they don't contribute to this uh, generalized hydrodynamics regime. Uh, so it turns out actually the relevant uh, low-lying excitation is the, a one particle whole pair. And you can see this is kind of more important and decays uh, slower than these contributions because this one particle whole pair excitation is uh, gapless. So the point is uh, you can create uh, the particle on a whole pair with almost opposite energy that almost cancel each other with as little total energy as you want. Uh, so now what is uh, what we have to do is just straightforward calculate uh, this guy. So this is what we want to calculate in our field theory, the one particle whole pair on top of some thermodynamic background. Um, actually, we won't do all of this, but we 
only need to do a simpler thing because we are only interested in the long distance limit of the correlation function. Uh, so when we put this guy in a correlation function, we're gonna integrate over rapidities and we're gonna do a stationary phase approximation. Uh, and that leads to the fact that we only need this limit of the form factor where the two particles are have rapidities close to each other, the particle on the whole. Yeah, so the kappa point is here. Uh, so here is the so this is a uh, yeah the the whole paper is calculating the uh, this thing where I won't go to the gory details of that calculation but just a general strategy, which is uh, uh, just consider the finite volume regularization of this guy, uh, which looks like uh, this. So, uh, so if you go at finite volume. Uh, you can write this in terms of normal form factors with a bunch of particles, where that bunch of particles follows the distribution rho, rho theta. So, yeah, so here this is a normal form factor on top of the vacuum. But here, so this is the set of rapidities corresponding to your back, thermodynamic background state in the outgoing state, and this is your. Yeah, so I'm talking about this set of particles and this set of particles. Yeah. But remember, this set of particles gets shifted because I added extra excitation, so this get a shift. So here I have background particles, background particles plus a shift, which the point is that we are completely able to calculate this shift on each of these background particles, and it depends on the rapidity of the additional particles and of this regulator kappa. And we can work out very carefully what this thing goes to in all these uh, nice limits. Um, the point is this shift is uh, proportional to this kappa. So as I take this kappa to zero, all of these shifts will also go to zero. Now, I told you there are annihilation poles whenever uh, Right, so uh, some theta equals another theta plus uh, pi i. So this expression is going to have a bunch of poles. It's all poles, which looks uh, scary, but it's actually nice because that tells you a lot about the structure. So, uh, you know, so all of these particles are about to annihilate with all of these particles when I take this uh, kappa to zero. And this will give you a nice uh, recurrence relation between this form factor and the one with two fewer particles, and then that's also related to fewer particles and fewer particles. So in the end, the expression looks like this, where you have uh, a sum over form factors with a different number of uh, particles, where this corresponds to this uh, uh, recurrence relation that this form factor contains all the form factors with uh, fewer and fewer particles. Uh, and the important point here is that, uh, so here we have the fancy form factor we define on top of this uh, thermodynamic background, but the form factors in this side are not fancy form factor. These are the standard uh, form factors on top of the vacuum. And this denotes that is a connected part of that form faction, which uh, good for you if you know what that is, but I won't go into that. Uh, but uh, the point is these are all in principle known all stuff uh, from the 80s that you know how to compute these form factors and knowing this you can uh, compute uh, these address form factors. Now you take this two par uh, particle hole form factor put it in your correlator very simply like a couple of lines and you get this uh, uh, two point correlation function. Uh, so here is just a contribution from the one particle whole pair form factor, uh, which in turn, is a, in turn is a sum over an infinite number of standard form factors. And the point is this prediction, this computation agrees exactly with the prediction from a GHD from that uh, nice uh, paper by Benjamin I told you before. And uh, that's that for that. Uh, right, so, so 
you do the firm the first leading form factor in this uh, simple uh, uh, limit where the two rapidities are equal and you recover the prediction from gst now moving on a bit quickly uh, so yeah so something else uh, that can be done is uh, to look at one point function when you have an inhomogeneous uh, state for instance this state that i described before described by uh, position dependent uh, uh, chemical potential. Uh, so the strategy here is uh, so we want to compute this uh, just with uh, form factors uh, stupidly without making typical assumptions from uh, GHT. So the strategy is uh, so if you assume this uh, this uh, space dependent is low enough then uh, that you can kind of split this guy into cells where instead of being just a uh, arbitrary x dependent you have piecewise uh, constant uh, chemical potentials uh, yeah basically you can break this guy into uh, into blocks of a uh, size l where does the size of the cell and uh, so there's uh, then uh, you can kind of redefine these uh, chemical potentials of fish block by extracting one uh, one overall chemical potential which doesn't depend on the cell you're in so this is arbitrary any chemical potential that i want i will fix it later and the point of this is to kind of extract an overall chemical potential here such that this guy looks like uh, uh, many point uh, functions. So here you have uh, the GDE expectation value of a bunch of operators, one from each cell, which corresponds to each of these uh, cells here. And this approximation holds in the limit of uh, large cells. And what we want to do is uh, to choose the most convenient arbitrary chemical potential that makes this expression the simplest. Okay. So now this uh, correlation functions we can do with form factors. Uh, uh, important point is that not all the operators here are non-trivially correlated to each other, right? Because uh, uh, the point is that uh, this many point function looks like this. You have your operator and here you have all your cells in your initial state. And the point is that the different cells are not correlated to each other in this leading term we want to calculate because kind of they are outside of each other's light goal. So the correlation between the two of them is decays exponentially. Well, the correlation between this cell and your operator uh, uh, is within the light goal. So you only need to evaluate the correlation of the operate between the operator and each cell within the light cone of that operator. So in the end, your one point function looks like this, where you have uh, first just the zero point function of that operator and then corrections from the two point function between your operator and each of these uh, cells in the initial state. And the point is, these are two point functions that we know how to calculate. This is exactly as the one from the previous result, like homogeneous correlation function with this, uh, set of uh, betas I am yet to choose. So we know these guys, how to calculate them. Uh, and we can calculate them, but the point that uh, makes it uh, even nicer is that I am still free to choose these arbitrary uh, betas. Um, there exists, there is a single simplest choice of this beta, which uh, uh, makes kind of, so because I know the expression of, uh, of all these uh, two point functions. Uh, I can see from that expression that I can make them all vanish at once by choosing a particularly uh, judicious uh, set of, of chemical potentials. And then that happens to be exactly the one that is predicted by, uh, by the equation of motions of uh, GHT. So I do that, I choose this, all of these uh, terms vanish. I just remain with this one point function in this state. And this is the prediction from generalized hydrodynamics uh, derived without assuming generalized hydrodynamics. 
so that's also uh, uh, yeah so one has access to higher corrections here if one is so inclined by including uh, more fun factors and grinding through it uh, i was not so inclined uh, yeah, so there's a future list of uh, things that one would like to do uh, so yeah, so I, still, I looked at homogeneous two-point function and inhomogeneous one-point function. Naturally, we would like to look at inhomogeneous two-point functions for which there are GAT predictions, but uh, we haven't gotten there yet. Uh, another thing is uh, we would like to uh, so calculate corrections like this that go beyond the standard GAT predictions. And perhaps uh, we can compare with uh, new methods that are coming up uh, recently to go beyond the GHT. Like for example, the Paul I think will talk about quantum correction to GHT. Jacopo might talk about diffusive uh, GHT and so on. Um, yeah, so there's also yeah, you can take classical and or non-relativistic limits of this uh, field theory, and there you can really compare with a lot of uh, nice uh, doable numerics and things. Uh, anyway, things in the future. Uh, so I don't always have the attention of so many uh, physicists around the world. So I'll use this opportunity to leave you with a much more important and timely problem in physics, uh, which is this. That's all. Okay. Uh, so thanks, Axel. Thanks for the very interesting talk and also for the last slide. Uh, are there any quick questions? I'm sure there are many because it was uh, very interesting, but quick. Well, maybe me. Please, Jakub. Hi, Axel. So, um, the, um, the, so JHT basically is the settled point of, uh, of correlation functions, right? I mean, you you obtain GHD if you take subtle points of uh, of your correlation functions, like large key. Uh, yes, uh, yes, so this, uh, yes. So, yeah, so basically, so, everything that goes beyond GHD is by not taking the subtle points, yeah. or there are also uh, other subtle points that you can take that are not included in GHD. Uh, so, to my understanding of of this result, so the two-point function here, I wrote, so this is the leading contribution, and I wrote here plus non-standard GHD corrections. So this comes from two sources. So one is that, so this is from the one particle whole term, but not only that, uh, this, this is in this limit of equal rapidity, which comes from stationary phase approximation. Now stationary yes. phase approximation has corrections which come at a higher order in T, so this contribute here. So there's from the same particle whole form factor corrections, but there's also corrections from uh, higher form factors with, uh, with four particle holes, uh, with, uh, whatever number of particles and holes, and those contribute. But the nice thing is you can show those are higher. So, but if you take like, for example, the two particle whole pair form factor and do stationary phase approximation, the leading contribution is one over T squared. And you can show that. Yes, but the question was more like uh, if you can find also a set of, I mean, I mean, because now you're taking stationary phase approximation around certain minima, right, of dispersion relation, but uh, maybe there are other minima that are not included in the, because uh, these are always limit of zero momentum, which are like hydrodynamic yeah, well, states, but. I mean, I, I don't have uh, knowledge of something like that. I, I, not, that I, not that I have seen something like that. Okay. Other very quick questions. I have one. Ah, please go ahead. Hi. Uh, this is very interesting. Um, the question is, uh, have you tried to go beyond the point? You know that you can compute uh, arbitrary correction uh, after the point. Have you thought about it or? Uh, yeah, first, nice, uh, nice room you have in space. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah, so yes, yeah, so actually we're kind of working on that. Uh, so 
one current project we have and we're fighting about this uh, for a while is going from this form factor to the general so going from this to this is a project we've been uh, talking about for a while and uh, it's not that simple but uh, i think uh, we'll do it in the in the near future and once you have the general form factor for any for any two rapidities then you can compute corrections to that uh, uh, subtle. So then you can. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much.